It is the Unscripted Ohio Podcast for Friday, September the 14th. You've been waiting for this game a long time. TCU, Ohio State, kicking off 8 p.m. Saturday night from Arlington, Texas. AT&T Stadium, otherwise known as Jerry World. Kevin Noon, publisher of Buckeye Grove, and Billy Wessels, publisher of Purple Menace, will be along to help preview this huge showdown. Why did TCU back out of the home and home in favor of the one-off? We'll find out from Billy Wessels. It's the Unscripted Ohio Podcast coming up next. You are now listening to the Unscripted Ohio Podcast, brought to you by Buckeye Grove. For all the latest Buckeyes news, analysis, reaction, and the best Ohio State community on the entire internet, head over to BuckeyeGrove.com or follow us on Twitter at Ohio State Rivals. Without any further delay, it's time to get unscripted. Broadcasting from Podcast Central, a place that is not his mother's basement. Hey, Ma, we get some meatloaf? We promise. Here's your host, Kyle Lamb. Hey, Ma, the meatloaf. Hey, good Friday, everybody. Welcome back to the Unscripted Ohio Podcast, presented by BuckeyeGrove.com. I'm your host, Kyle Lamb. How you feeling, Buckeye fans? It's finally here. If Oregon State and Rutgers were the appetizers to the 2018 Buckeyes football season, then I guess this is the main course. Hopefully, Horned Frog will be dessert on Saturday night for Ohio State, if you pardon my very poor cliche, my attempt at humor. Uh, Look, this is a, a game that I know everybody has had circled on the calendar for a long, long time. Really, since the conclusion of last year, I think Ohio State fans were looking at this game really expecting a lot. Now, I think this matchup has kind of lost a little bit of its luster. TCU comes into the game a top 25 team. They're a formidable opponent. Um, You know, they have some playmakers. They have weapons. Uh, Don't get caught into the hype that maybe TCU fans are getting caught up in right now with this team. I mean, don't get me wrong. TCU definitely has some weapons. They're capable of scoring points on Ohio State, but if you read some of the TCU message boards, look at some of the fans on Twitter and on the message boards, I mean, my goodness, you you would think these guys are, uh, you know, one of the most explosive teams in the history of college football. I mean, one fan, you probably saw this going around on Twitter, said that they are the fastest team in America. I mean, let's slow down on that, you know, uh, you know, that rhetoric, that's that's hyperbole for sure. Um, but look, these guys are very talented. It kind of reminds me of uh, the TCU speed, kind of reminds me of the whole SEC speed spiel. You know, that kind of is what this game feels like right now. If you look at it from a Big 12 or TCU perspective, they're looking at this like, you know, Ohio State is just that slow dumb team from up north, right, that, that can't match up playmakers. I mean, my goodness, how delusional do you have to be to look at this game like that? Even if you think the Big Ten is slow and plotting, then, which they're not, by the way. I mean, if you compare it to the Big 12 in the last, you know, eight years, actually Big Ten has had more receivers and running backs drafted in the top four rounds than the Big 12 has. And that's based on the current teams that are there now, not just, or I'm sorry, the last, I said eight years. I was actually last five years that applies, but that's based on the current structure of the big 12. And look, I mean, I know the big 10 has more teams than the big 12 and the numbers are comparable. So it's not a huge gap, but the point is the big 10 is not lacking in speed and talent and athleticism. Okay. It's not a slow plotting conference. Um, You know, it's certainly fallen short over the last, couple cycles, recruiting cycles, as maybe the SEC has. And, and right now, the last couple years, the ACC was really good in speed and athleticism. But the Big Ten is not lacking in those departments now. It has playmakers. I think part of the reputation is due to the fact, like, there are so many pro-style offenses in the Big Ten right now. You've, I mean, Michigan is a true pro-style. Penn State and Michigan State, while they have some spread concepts, I mean, They tend to be pro-style offenses. So I think it kind of looks worse for Ohio State as far as their competition is concerned because they're not facing these wide-open spread offenses on a daily basis that you see in the Big 12. 
And part of the problem is the Big 12 defenses are not very good or have not been very good over much of the last several years. And so you see these wide open games and it makes the speed and talent levels for these teams look better than they actually are. And look, like I said, TCU, don't get me wrong, they are a very, very talented team. They have a lot of playmakers and a lot of guys that can take it to the house if Ohio State misses tackles or misses assignments. So this is not a game that Ohio State needs to take lightly. And TCU is more talented on the offensive side of the football than a lot of the teams in the Big Ten. But all I'm saying is that it's not the fastest team in America. And even if you believe this team is better or faster than a lot of these Big Ten teams, which, you know, maybe they are, it's not like Ohio State's defense and defensive backs specifically. It's not like they're not facing the t- this kind of talent every day in practice. I mean, Ohio State defensive backs have to go up against Ohio State's receivers every single day. They see this kind of talent all of the time. They're used to it. This is not going to be anything new. They're not going to be taken by surprise in this game. They're not going to be caught off guard. Anyhow, so I've got Kevin Noon will be up uh, coming up later in the show in the Buckeye Beat segment. He's going to preview this game from the Ohio State perspective. He will be heading down to Jerry World to preview it today. Very excited to talk to him about this game and, and his trip coming up to the DFW area. Uh, coming up here in just a minute, Billy Wessels, the publisher of PurpleMenace.com. That is the Rivals TCU affiliate. He'll be coming up, and he's going to tell us, number one, why did TCU turn this series into a one-off situation rather than a home-and-home? Home? He's got the answer to that, and we'll talk about the game from the TCU perspective. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter. Would love to hear from you. Um, of course, you can catch me at KYLAM, the number eight. And would love to have you rate and review the podcast. We're always trying to grow this, uh, get more guests, more banter, find ways to improve the show. As always, you can catch us on Google Play, iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. And of course, Mondays and Fridays, we publish on BuckeyeGrove.com. So make sure you rate and review the show. But look, this is a big game. I'm really excited for it. Um, you know, it's going to be kind of weird to sit there all day long after the last couple of games have been a little bit, you know, noon and then 3.30 starts. Now we're going to be sitting there Saturday just waiting all day long. And and the college football schedule this week is a little bit down, I think, to what it's been the, the first two weeks. So it's going to be a long Saturday waiting for this. Th- this has got the chance to be a very good game, no doubt. I, I tend to think we're going to see motivated, uh, energetic, crisp Ohio State on Saturday. I think what we've seen from Dwayne Haskins in the offense is legit, despite the competition. You know, Oregon State and Rutgers are power conference teams. I don't think it's just the product of the competition here. I think what Ohio State has done offensively is legit. I think this is the true offense we're going to see this year. And don't get me wrong, they're not going to run up 70 points, uh, 650 yards a game. They're not going to do that on a regular basis against the Michigans of the world, against Wisconsin, Penn State. That's not a realistic expectation. And TCU has an improved defense. They've got some NFL caliber players on that defense. They're going to make Ohio State punt, and we haven't seen Drew Christman a lot so far in two games. I think we've only seen him uh, once or, you know, I think twice maybe. So Chrisman is going to be probably a little bit busier. You know, Ohio State's not going to take it to the end zone every single possession. But I think they've got a chance to really make a statement here in Arlington, Texas. So we'll see what happens. But I'm very excited for this game. It's been after such a, you know, weird August and kind of a distracting August where we didn't really get to talk a lot of football. We're easing our way in. I know a couple blowouts. We're fun to watch, but there's a part of you, and I know it's there. I think all of you are kind of wondering. It's like, well, what happens when they play a TCU or a better opponent? But you kind of want that. You want to see how Ohio State responds, and if they come out with you know full throttle and, and just lay the, the wood on TCU, I don't think anybody's going to mind that. I think everybody will be more than happy. 
even if it means getting your hopes up to unrealistic expectations the rest of the way, I think that's something you're definitely going to live with. So let's uh, get this perspective coming from the TCU side now with Billy Wessels, publisher of PurpleMenace.com. Billy, uh, thanks for taking the time to preview this game. It, it's, uh, it's definitely a, uh, uh, a big game, and it should be a lot of fun to talk about. Oh, yeah, it's definitely the game we've been looking forward to, at least in fourth for what was originally scheduled in 2011 or 12, I think. So uh, five-plus years, and all the drama that's kind of surrounded the two programs going back to the, uh, uh, the Gordon uh, Gee statement in 2010 and obviously the whole uh, college football playoff fiasco in 2014. So, yeah, we've been excited for this matchup for a while. So, yeah, let's, I want to ask you about that. So this was originally scheduled as a home-and-home home series, and, you know, I, I guess from the way Gary Patterson describes it, he requested that they, you know, move it to Jerry World and, and have this one-off in Arlington as opposed to, you know, having the home-and-home. Home. What was his rationale or his uh, thinking behind that? I think it's one of those things where you only have to beat a team one time, right, where you only hurt your – say you lose a game this year – uh, you can still make the playoff, right, if that's your only loss. But uh, this year and next year, you only have to worry about the opponent one time. I mean, I don't really like it myself. I would rather I would rather this game be in fourth right now than going up to the horseshoe next year uh, personally. But, hey, coaches see $5 million and, and fan boosters, and everyone sees $5 million of the, the jackpot for this game. So uh, I think it's more about affecting just one season as far as, as affecting two. If you happen to lose both these games, you're pretty well shot for two years in a row in the playoffs. How are the, you know, you mentioned there's a lot of excitement. How are the fans taking this? Or as far as like going to Arlington and playing this on a neutral field, are, are they excited? Are they willing to spend the money to go to this game? Uh, is there trepidation? You know, how, how are they reacting to, you know, the, the hype of this game? Well, the fans will be there, and especially since college game day is coming to TCU's campus, which we didn't, we didn't really expect. Normally, the games at AT&T Stadium, they still do the show in Fort Worth, but they do it at uh, kind of downtown. It's called Sundance Square here. Uh, it's a pretty nice little area of downtown, pretty quiet, pretty set, uh, set away. Uh, it's usually where they do it, but get, with game day being here, people are excited, people are pumped. But the issue is, if you look at Cowboy Stadium or AT&T Stadium, it holds 100,000 people, right? So all of TCU's living alumni is right around 100,000 people. So that's the, if you put every person that ever went to TCU in Cowboy Stadium, you'd fill it up, maybe. But as far as Ohio State, it's five and a half times as many, you know, what, 550,000 living alumni up there. And, and y'all travel really well and everything like that. So I do think where TCU is, is excited and ready to go for this game, I think it's more of an issue of this will still probably be 70-30 red, maybe 65-35 red. Um, it's it's going to be really tough for, for TCU any kind of home field advantage. Like when they played Oklahoma last year in the Big 12 title game, it was still mostly red. It was 65-35 red. And so I expect to see that again this weekend. Yeah, Ohio State does ha- tend to have a history of taking over these big stadiums, especially in neutral neutral field environments. Uh, they they managed to actually, uh, you know, by some reports, outnumber Alabama in the Sugar Bowl a few years ago. So uh, it's been known to happen a few times. Um, so let's talk about TCU's team. This is an interesting dynamic here because in the past TCU has really been known for the defense first and and not to overshadow the defense but especially with the loss of Ross Blaylock which we'll get to here in a few minutes the offense has really kind of taken the headlines you know and a lot of it has to do with Sean Robinson and and the receivers he's got to work with Uh, you know what's your first assessment here through two games of the TCU offense yeah it really is about the new quarterback anytime you make a change there if you have a new guy coming in that's who everyone wants to talk about. It's what everyone focuses on. So Sean Robinson has been the guy the first two weeks. Uh, I've been asked a couple times this week to give him a letter grade. I've been putting a B- minus on him. Um, he's always been really athletic. Uh, he's very fast. He'll be one of the fastest guys on the field on Saturday, no doubt in my mind. Uh, big arm. The issue is accuracy and being able to put good touch on the ball. He's overthrown a couple guys uh, so far this season already. He's, he's thrown balls into the dirt on guys that are wide open. So he's been really inconsistent. He's getting better. Uh, he's only thrown one interception, and it was a really bad one, too. Against us. I mean, he stared his guy down, just threw it basically right to the corner, who jumped in front. So it was, he, he's been, he's been, it's hard to deny his athleticism, but sometimes you need to sit back and, and sit in the pocket and, and ro- go through your progressions and hit guys that are open and, and make the smart, good passes. And he hasn't been able to do, hasn't been able to do that yet. Now, the SMU game was different because it was, it was raining. And what can you take from a game against Southern, right? It's an FCS school or a SWAC school. 
it's not a real good test. He would have been better off going against his own defense in that game. So what can he? we don't know exactly what to expect from Sean Robinson. It was the biggest test he's ever had, clearly. And then he's got pretty, a pretty good stable of receivers. Devontae Turbin had a big game against SMU with a punt return touchdown and a receiving touchdown. Uh, Jalen Rager had a couple drops in the SMU game, but the, the rain had probably had a factor in that. Jalen Austin's a senior, a veteran leader on that side of the ball, too. And a, a really good stable of running back with Darius Anderson. It's finally 100% healthy. He's going to be full go this game, and so is Shea Wallalanalua, the other running back. So those two, that dual-headed monster, they'll need to run the ball, uh, keep the ball out of Haskins' hands, and, and let TC control the clock. Do you see uh, TCU doing a lot of these, you know, short passes, you know, kind of kind of the boundary type things and keep the ball outside and, and try to beat Ohio State one-on-one? Uh, would you expect that to kind of be their game plan here? Yeah, if we see fewer than 10 screens, I'll be surprised between all the guys they have on the outside with Turpin, uh, with a true freshman named Tay Barber, who's from uh, this area, who's really good in that same sort of small receiver, get him in space, let him go, kind of roll. Uh, Jalen Reger was one of the fastest guys in the country coming out of high school, too. Also was the national champion in the vertical, uh, or the long jump, rather. So he's extremely athletic. So he's a guy that is that is awfully impressive. And they have plenty of weapons on the outside. So I bet they find a way to take some pressure off of Sean and use kind of the short passing game as almost a bit of a running game extended. So on the defensive side of the ball, let's start with the loss of Blaylock. You know, before the season, obviously, you know, with him being co-Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year, that was a big loss for them. Uh, you know, how has uh, Terrell Cooper uh, stepped up in his absence so far? Yeah, it's it's uh, Cooper's kind of first little bit of run. He was registered last year, so we're kind of seeing what we can see out of him, uh, getting used to it, getting more in action. But the biggest pressure is going to be on the defensive end in this game. Uh, obviously, next to Cooper, you have Corey Bethel, who's done a really good job to a defensive tackle. Uh, and Joe Brodnack is a senior at that position, too. So the defensive tackle spot, while Cooper's getting the, the start and title, they rotate a lot of guys there. I'm not going to be totally surprised if you see Cooper for maybe 20 snaps and then it rotates around. Uh, the defensive end spot's Ben Banigou, is another guy who, while Bosa is probably is going to be the best defensive event in this game, Bandigou is going to be right up there with him. He's another guy that could be a late first-round draft pick. Um, on the other side is Ty Summers, who was a, who is the, one of the team's all-time leading tackler from the linebacker spot, moved down to defensive end, and now could be moving back to some linebacker for this game because we're getting L.J. Collier back off the bench. He's missed the first two games of the year. So this defensive line for TC is going to be really good. Also, I think Ohio State's going to be better, obviously, because they have three guys that could be uh, first-round draft picks this year. But uh, TCU's not not too shabby on the defensive line front either. Yeah, it's interesting. TCU's uh, linebackers kind of have some of the same issues that Ohio State's linebackers have had over the past year and a half. You know, last year they gave up a lot of the big intermediate plays, you know, the, the missed tackles and, and the big plays from the backs and ends out of the backfield. Uh, you know, how is that looking so far? I know it's, it's hard to judge with, you know, SMU and Southern so far, but how, how are the linebackers doing in those, you know, those shorter intermediate routes? Yeah, they've so Garrett Wallow is is kind of my favorite linebacker. He's a sophomore out of uh, an area just outside of New Orleans. Uh, so he's really talented. He's a he's a converted safety. Uh, so is Arico Evans, who's another guy that's been starting at linebacker too. Another guy that's played some safety in high school. So these guys have some coverability, but the issue is they're more of like the big hitter kind of guys. They want to go and lay you out. Uh, they're not as good in cover skills. That's one thing I think you might see more. Ty Summers, a linebacker. He's got a bit of more of a history covering guys, especially on the shorter routes like that. So if Ohio State does start to do that and it becomes effective, maybe Summers plays less at end and more back at linebacker where he's more familiar. Um, as far as like some big plays, they've given up a big play in both the SMU and the Southern game. Um, the, the SMU game, again, was like the third play of the game. It was still driving rain. It was a long run where he bounced off two tacklers and just took off. Uh, that won't be an issue here against Ohio State as far as the weather goes. But, of course, those running backs are a lot more talented than the TCU's seen yet. The, uh, obviously, this game is played indoors. We won't have to worry about the rain. You know, TCU had to deal with the rain last week. Ohio State had to deal with the rain last week. Both teams will be glad to get in, you know, in dry conditions and not have to deal with that. What, what is the, you know, if you would preview the TCU special teams for me, the kicking game, punting game, that sort of thing? Yeah, so uh, Adam Nunez, the punter, is really talented. Uh, hopefully they don't have to use him too much, though. That's, that's always the hope and dream. You never have to use a punter. Uh, Cole Bunce, kicker, he's been perfect so far. No, he, that's not true. He missed like a 54-yarder against SMU uh, off the crossbar. So it was, a, it was a long kick just off the crossbar. I don't even know why they attempted that, honestly. Uh, but just to see his range. Uh, but he's been pretty active. Him and Jonathan Song have been kind of competing in camp. We've only seen Bunce so far. Uh, freshman snapper, uh, so he had a bad snap in the SMU game. I don't know if you saw the weird punt that ended up turning into a safety. They'll snap over the punter's head. So 
Uh, working on the true freshman at long snapper is kind of your biggest issue there. Uh, but the punting kick game is solid for TC this year. Uh, kicking's always been been kind of a question mark, but it seems to be getting, uh, getting that ship righted. So, Billy, I want you uh, to give me your biggest keys from, from the TCU perspective, you know, seeing this team so far this year. Uh, what do you think are the biggest you know, takeaways for what TCU has to do to be able to win this game? Sean Robinson has to stay healthy and stay on the field and take care of the football. He's been banged up in a couple games this year. His one star last year was against Texas Tech, and he suffered kind of a rib injury in that game. Um, then he played against SMU last weekend. He kind of left a little bit early. They're already winning by 25 or 30 points in the fourth quarter, so it's time to get him out anyway. But on his last throw, he got a little banged up there. So he's he's not quite 100%. He's never been like fully 100% either. He got banged up a lot in high school too, so he's got to stay healthy and stay on the field. Um, he's fully expected to start and be ready to go for this game, but it's one of the things where you got to keep an eye on that. And if he, let, and if, if he turns up the ball over three times, and he's going to get into a whole lot of trouble, and it'll be a really tough hill to climb against a talented team at Ohio State. Uh, so take care of the football. Don't make a whole lot of mistakes. Don't make any dumb penalties. Uh, try and keep from getting beat on the deep ball. I mean, Ohio State should just – there's not a whole lot of flaws in Ohio State's games. It's going to be taking advantage of whatever mistakes they do make and make some big plays happen with your receivers. Billy Wessels, he is the publisher of PurpleMenace.com. He covers TCU on the Rivals Network. And, of course, uh, we'll be covering the big game here this weekend, TCU and Ohio State. Kickoff at 8 p.m. from Jerry World, AT&T Stadium in Arlington. Billy, thanks for uh, previewing TCU for us and appreciate taking the time to do this. Yeah, no problem. Enjoy it. Hope uh, maybe see you all out there. Stretch runtime here at Unscripted Ohio. Kick up your feet as we cross the finish line with the Buckeye Beat, the latest in Ohio State news and notes. Kick the tires and light the fires, Big Daddy. All right, I'm joined now by Kevin Noon, publisher of BuckeyeGrove.com. Kevin, you are, well, when most people are listening to this, you're probably already en route to DFW. Um, uh, you've been to this place before. You know, it's it's a, every bit as big as they say it is. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Jerry World really uh, spared, spared no expense and is just a, a colossal venue to play in I've, I've been to original cowboy stadium and it was it was all well and good but this place is uh next level how much time last time you were there did you spend watching the game on the uh big screen i i watched most of it on the big screen to be honest because the press box is kind of off in the corner which is kind of the new norm for uh, NFL stadiums when you can put suites at the 50, so they're not so concerned about where they put the media. And at least at a venue like uh, AT&T Stadium with that giant screen, it's just a lot easier to watch the screen. I mean, you do look down so you can kind of see the all-22 action of what's going on. But you know, one, once the ball moves a little bit, your, your eyes are drawn to that giant uh, jumbotron. I heard a rumor, I hope you can confirm this for me, that it's not going to rain indoors, which decidedly favors TCU, because apparently uh, the gist I'm getting from, from down yonder around TCU fan base, uh, rain apparently only affects TCU, and I guess it didn't affect Ohio State uh, the last two weeks. Well, they are the fastest team ever assembled in the history of the of the universe. I mean, if you listen to their fans, and if this game were in snow or or I guess in a cornfield or something along those lines, maybe maybe a Big Ten team would have have some sort of advantage. But yeah, rain only really affects TCU apparently, and unless a unless a bunch of pipes go, I think I think it'll be dry inside AT and T Stadium. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, this isn't Oakland Alameda County Coliseum, so we shouldn't have have the issue of the plumbing um uh that was a crappy joke no pun intended uh so anyway um let's assess first it, it appears the good news here going into this game for ohio state which you know some would say probably is the first real test of the season it doesn't seem to be injuries do not seem to be an issue uh you know from what i gather just you know reading up on the beat it, it sounds like you know everybody's got the all clear for this week yeah, I mean, I think we're still going to see Tough Borland on a bit of a pitch count. Uh, he went from 10 snaps to 21 snaps. 
I mean, does that mean he's going to go into the 30s? I mean, if he goes into the 30s, I mean, he, he's going to be getting close to playing half the game, and and the defensive coaches have already said that they really would like to be able to platoon him and uh, Baron Browning at the at the Mike linebacker position. Jordan Fuller came back in week two after week one where he was held out precautionary for hamstring and went that whole game, or as, as much as the starters really went. I think that uh, he should be fine. I, I have not heard anything about any sort of setback. I mean, really, the Buckeyes are, are, are very healthy. I mean, there's not been any in-game injuries of, of note that have happened. Guys that have been hurt going into the season are still hurt. I mean, they obviously lost Brandon Bowen, who underwent surgery. He's probably done for the season. But, you know, nothing nothing significant happening for Ohio State in terms of guys that we've seen play in the first uh, two games. You know, I'm, I'm kind of interested in your take on Sean Wade. You know, so much was made about him this past week, playing a great game, uh, playing a lot of nickel. The talk is, you know, he would be eventually moved to safety, or at least that's the hope, and, and they're trying to get rid of him for that, but he didn't really take safety snaps. How do you see his playing time progressing, and do you think he'll make that transition here this year? You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I think we're just going to have to kind of see how things are. I mean, he can play corner, he can play nickel, he can play safety. He's just too talented to keep off of the field. A lot of times you're going to see guys who are going to be somewhat resistant, at least at first, of moving down from corner to safety. I mean, they see corner as a uh, as more of a Cadillac position. I mean, obviously Ohio State has had quite the quite the run of uh, corners here recently, but I think once you get that opportunity to get out there and, and contribute and play and, and hit somebody and Sean Wade had an interception against Rutgers, I mean, I think he's going to be all for going wherever he can and get into the mix. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not ready to sit there and say that their safeties are going to be uh, – are going to be Jordan Fuller and Sean Wade. I think Isaiah Pryor is coming along nicely, but you know, you, you do want to have a situation of where you can have Wade out there as much as possible. You know, I saw this week on the offensive side of the ball, Ryan Day made an interesting comment. He, he said that, you know, the pace, I guess he said it after the game over the weekend, but he said the pace was slowed down against Rutgers a little bit purposefully, you know, on purpose. And I, I was curious if he expanded up on that any on Monday, you know, as to what their idea is for tempo. If if they did that to slow things down to show on film for the TCU game, or or what the, his rationale may have been behind that. Yeah, you know, you 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 have to wonder. I mean, we're trying to we're trying to figure out, you know, a new coach in in Ryan Day and. You, you you don't you don't know what the methodology always is going to be in in in, in things like that so you know ask me after the game <laughs> I, I, I i don't know i don't know if i have a good answer right now what what do you think will happen on, on saturday as far as uh, you think they're going to come out throwing you know playing the up-tempo game do you think they'll be a little more conservative than they've been the last two weeks i mean not that they've been uh, you know they've been pretty balanced from run to pass. It's it's not that they've been you know just throwing the ball all the time. But uh, do you think we'll see that same same kind of style and and aggressiveness we've seen in the first two games? Well, I mean, I think tempo is predicated by success. I mean, if they're moving the ball and moving the chains, they're going to be able to run tempo. And I don't think that they're necessarily going to get away from it, uh, especially with TC running that four two five defense and having probably a lot of guys that fit in multiple roles in there, especially with that. Uh, with that that extra safety out there in the field, they probably don't want to give them the opportunity to uh, to do a lot of subbing and things along those lines. But I also don't see Ohio State coming out and running tempo just for the sake of running tempo. I think that you have to go with what what your what fits the offense there. And if you have prolonged drives, you are going to have to sub here and there because you know you can't ask guys to be out there. You know, especially like your running backs or your receivers, if you're sending them deep, you know, they can't do that six, seven plays in a row. So, you know, I, I think the desire will be to, to, to keep it moving fast and to try and keep TCU maybe on their heels. But, you know, TCU can run a fast offense, too. So it's not necessarily a case of, you know, that they're going to be showing them something that they've not practiced against before when they go ones against ones. So it, it, it'll be interesting to see what they do there. But I tend to think that Ryan Day is going to want to keep it moving pretty fast. You know, I'm curious your your uh, expectation for breakout players, if there's anybody you think will stand out in this game. I'm, I'm interested to see Ben Victor because Ohio State really hasn't – he hasn't done much in the first two weeks. I think he had a few, few catches against Rutgers, a uh, little bit more than he had against Oregon State. But they haven't really needed him, and they've had such uh, success with the big play and, you know, big runs and, and big, you know, pass and catches – 
you know, Vic, Victor has not been a huge part of the offense, but I think in a game like this where red zone performance is going to be more important, I, I'm anxious to see if Victor gets involved and has some catches down there in the end zone when they need him in that situation. I'm curious if you have any players that you're looking forward to maybe standing out in this game. Yeah, with Victor, I mean, he had four targets and three receptions against uh, Rutgers. He did not have a reception against Oregon State. We just really haven't seen him be that guy that they've had a lot of success hooking up with on the fade. I mean, we, they've it's happened a couple of times. He's come down out of bounds. It just hasn't necessarily been there as a, as a, as a big-bodied receiver. I mean, you know, as for me, I guess offensively, I just I, I don't know if there's an unknown guy because we just know of who everybody is on offense for the uh, for the most part. But I just I just tend to think that this is just going to be a Haskins type of game. I think he's going to take a huge step forward in his, uh, you know, e- even though nobody's going to sit there and say they're putting together Heisman campaigns. I think he's going to have a really big game on offense. I, I think we'll see him even run it a little bit because it'll it'll just be there. I mean, they'll be so concerned about who Ohio State's sending out in patterns and everything along those lines. There'll be a couple of obvious runs out there. They won't mes- necessarily be, you know, that straight-up designed run, but it, it'll it'll be there. And then on the defensive side of the ball, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm going to sit there and say that Pete Warner's going to have a big game in terms of somebody that maybe we're not talking about as much as some of the others. Obviously, everybody on the defensive line, you know, Nick Bosa had a huge game one. Chase Young had a big game two. Uh, the return of, of uh, Jordan Fuller was huge for the Buckeyes as well. I think everybody's focused on the Mike linebacker position so much, but I think Pete Werner's going to go out there and he's going to have a big game. It's going to be really important for Ohio State to keep containment, especially with a mobile quarterback like Sean Robinson, because you don't want to let him get run. But you know, most most of most of his run is is designed run more so than 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 the scramble and take off. So it's going to be it's going to be so important for Ohio State not to let you know, not to lose track of him and let him get to the outside and go, because once he gets in space, he can scoot. You know, and we joke about, you know, the TCU speed thing, but, you know, setting the jokes aside, this is an important game for Ohio State's outside linebackers, like you mentioned, Warner and Malik Harrison, because this TCU team does like the bubble screens, they like playing in space, they like getting to the outside, so this will be a big test for the Ohio State defense to contain those receivers and, and you know, some of the backs coming out of the backfield and, and making sure that they don't give up those long plays like they did against Oregon State. Yeah, don't get caught peeking into the backfield and, and getting caught flat-footed out there. There's going to be a lot to be uh, to be said about that. And, and I think that Bill Davis and Greg Schiano and Alex Grinch, talk about a name we haven't really talked about a lot this year with everything that's gone on, that bring in Alex Grinch, who's supposed to be you know, this all-star hire, and then all hell breaks loose. And we're, we're talking to Ryan Day and Greg Schiano every week, and there's not been any talk of uh, Alex Grinch. But I think they're going to have to make sure that they keep their guys fresh, and you can't really give anybody too long of a leash. If you're not out there making plays, you're out there playing hero ball, not doing your assignments. They need to get somebody out there who can because, you know, while I think Ohio State definitely could win a track meet against TCU in terms of, you know, just this, you know, pinball type of offensive game, it would, it would probably make uh, Ohio State fans feel a lot better if if Ohio State did not have, you know, have to score on every possession and, and you know, could keep TCU in the, you know, the high teens, low 20s. So prediction time, Kevin. I, I had on the BuckeyeGrove.com staff predictions, I had Ohio State 38-17. And I'm kind of feeling like that may be a little low from a over-under standpoint as far as the number of points are scored. Um, and, and I want people to know, like, I'm not necessarily being a homer here. Like, you know, Ohio State is just, you know, too much better than TCU. I, I actually still have reservations about this TCU team. They're talented. They've certainly got some skill positions that are very, very good. I just not sure. I'm not convinced about this TCU team. Everybody makes every, you know, this big deal about Ohio State playing Oregon State and Rutgers, but TCU has played Southern and SMU, and they haven't looked particularly great in either game. I'm not sure that TCU is is ready for this type of game. And I think Ohio State winds up blowing TCU out. And it's not necessarily that I think, you know, Ohio State is unbeatable. I just think in this game, I think the Buckeyes are going to look strong. What do you say on this? Yeah, I think that TCU is going to put up some points. I think it's just the nature of that they have an explosive offense. And Ohio State is still trying to solve a couple things on defense. But 
I don't I don't really think that TCU has faced an offense like Ohio State since they played Oklahoma last year and they played the Sooners twice and they got they got shellacked in both of those games and I'm and I'm not saying that it's going to necessarily be a shellacking I have Ohio State 41 TCU 21 in terms of our prediction piece I mean I could definitely see it getting out of hand I mean you're not not that 20 points is any sort of close game but I could I could definitely see it getting out of hand in terms of you know if if, if they cannot pressure Haskins of Ohio State's ginormous offensive line can keep you know keep the pocket and and Dwayne Haskins can step up when he needs to and he has some time to scan the field you know it's it's, it's going to be difficult for that secondary you know it, they could run a 4-2-10 and it may be it may be difficult the way that he's been dialed in throwing the ball and uh, you know I I'm not saying that there's not a scenario you know if Ohio State is minus three in turnovers you know, all bets are off. But as long as Ohio State comes out there and doesn't shoot themselves in their foot, you know, I, I think Ohio State's definitely a couple scores better. Kevin Noon, he will be deep in the heart of Texas this weekend covering Ohio State TCU. You can catch everything he has to say. The memoirs of a madman on BuckeyeGrove.com. You can catch him on Twitter at Kevin underscore Noon. Kevin, uh, safe travels down there and, and uh, you know, have fun there at Jerry World. Thanks, man. Talk soon. That's going to do it for the Unscripted Ohio podcast today. You can catch us Mondays and Fridays on BuckeyeGrove.com. Catch us on the archives on Google Play, iTunes, SoundCloud, and Stitcher. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate us and review us on any of your medium of choice. But thanks for listening. We will be back Monday to recap all of the action from the weekend. That's going to do it for me, everybody. Have a great one. You can get new episodes of Unscripted Ohio on Mondays and Fridays exclusively at BuckeyeGrove.com or anytime on SoundCloud, iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all things Ohio State.